pain, sadness, betrayal. Only the gods may ever know exactly what Caesar felt as he bled on the Senate's floor. But among all the uncertainties his assassination raised for Rome, these were certain. The Senate was dominated by treacherous murderers, the barbarians ready to strike, and its people hid in their homes, awaiting the coming decades of violence, death, and decadence. It was in this world that our hero found himself in. His tale began during the year of Cicero and Hybrida, for while Caesar was feeling disgusted by the tyranny shown by the Senate, his niece, Adia, had given birth to a son named Gaius Octavius Furinus. With his father dying Nola when he was just four years old, and his new stepfather never giving a single shit about him, Octavian was raised by his grandmother Julia, the elder sister of Julius Caesar, whom Octavian would greatly impress as he delivered her eulogy years later. Octavian later joined the College of Pontiffs, where he met and befriended Marcus Agrippa, a plebeian of unrivaled strength and military skill, and Gaius Messinus, an equestrian experienced in Roman politics. With their help, Augustus compensated for the poor health the gods gave him in exchange for such a high intellect, making him very prone to illnesses, which he refused to let hold him back. Growing up during the Civil War, it wasn't long before he heard Caesar was off to fight in Africa. He implored to join him, but was held back by his overprotective mother. When Caesar returned, Octavius approached him for the first time. He told him Agrippa's brother had fought in Cato's army, and so asked for his pardon. Caesar readily granted his wish, and Agrippa was so thankful he would become his most loyal friend. Later, as Caesar was preparing to fight in Hispania, Octavian managed to convince his mother to let him go, only for him to be struck by an illness and then get shipwrecked in enemy territory after recovering. By then, Caesar had just won the Battle of Monda, and when he found out Octavian had braved the countryside to find him, he was convinced his nephew was destined for greatness. He then sent Octavian to study in Macedonia, returning to Rome, where, not long after, he would find himself getting stabbed 27 times by the Senate. Which begs the question, where the fuck was Mark Anthony during all that? Actually, Brutus never went after him, he still had some shreds of dignity in his traitorous heart. Shame the Senate didn't. Once Anthony realized he wasn't in danger, as consul, he took hold of Caesar's will. In it, he was posthumously adopting Octavian as his son and heir, inheriting his name and fortune. He rushed to inform Octavian about it, and it was at this moment that Cleopatra attacked. You see, Cleopatra had made use of all that semen Caesar had pumped into her, absorbing his divine essence and using it to fuel her eastern black magic, which she used to cast a mind control spell on Anthony, the one she saw as the surest way to take power over Rome and destroy Aeneas' legacy once and for all. Now a puppet of Cleopatra, Anthony brought the assassins to the table and negotiate. They were to be pardoned of their crimes, and Caesar's reforms left intact. He also agreed not to talk ill of the assassins to the plebs, as he was to host his funeral oration. But when the day came, and the sight of his dead friend hit his eyes, Cleopatra's spell temporarily broke. Enraged once more, but still a man of his word, Anthony didn't badmouth the Senate, but simply reminded the plebs of all the great things Caesar did for them, and Rome at large, letting the assassins' actions speak for themselves. The plebs were driven by Anthony's eulogy, running through the streets to sack and burn all property belonging to any of Caesar's assassins, whom were then forced to flee the city scared for their lives. By then, the news of Caesar's death had reached Octavian, together with his last wishes. His mother begged him not to accept the adoption. His friends advised him to take the Macedonian legions and march on Rome. But when destiny came calling for Octavian, neither cowardice nor pure violence would suffice. Through cunning and virtue, he saw his duty to ensure his adoptive father's legacy. His mind made, Octavian sailed to Brundisium with his friends, there meeting with Caesar's veteran legions, who were preparing for the Parthian campaign. Being recognized as Caesar's chosen heir, the legions hailed him as their new leader. This allowed Octavian to get to Rome, and what did he find when he got there? That Anthony, Caesar's best friend, was dancing between hating and allying with the Senate. Octavian could smell that eastern magic was in the air, and instantly realized Cleopatra was behind this. Octavian openly denounced Anthony's pardon of the Senate, driving more of Caesar's veterans to his side, including two of the Macedonian legions. Seeing where the wind was blowing, Cicero denounced Anthony in a series of scathing orations, driving public opinion to Octavian's side. With just how powerful Octavian was becoming, Cleopatra ordered her servants to change strategy. Mark Anthony then renounced his pardon of the Senate, banishing them from Rome, and ordering it to give him Cisalpine Gaul to govern, instead of Macedonia. Anthony then marched north with his last three legions to force Cisalpine Gaul's governor to abdicate, a one named Decimus Brutus, who violently refused to abdicate. 
The Senate then declared Anthony an enemy of the state, sending both consuls Pansa and Hercius to defeat him. They didn't have enough legions, so they called on Octavian to join forces with them. Wait, hold the fuck on. Octavian joining his Caesarian legionnaires to help the Senate rescue Caesar's assassin from Caesar's best friend and his Caesarian legionnaires? Well, you might not see it now, pleb, but it was all part of Octavian's master plan to save Rome. And so he marched with the Senate north. And before Pansa could join his forces with Hercules and Octavian, Anthony suddenly ambushed him, obliterating his forces and severely injuring Pansa. Only for then to be his turn to be ambushed by Hercules, who then almost obliterated his forces. Anthony then retreated to siege Decimus and Mutina, where Hercules and Octavian faced him again. As they charged at Octavian's camp, Hercules was killed in the midst of fighting, with Octavian personally rescuing his body away from the battle. At the end of the day, Anthony's army was scattered, with him fleeing north of the Alps to link with Lapidus. Decimus instantly set pursuit, but Octavian just chilled with his eight legions. Abandoned, Decimus found himself locked between the Alps, Anthony's and Lapidus's legions, and hostile Gallic tribes. Not long after, a Gallic chieftain delivered Decimus' head to Anthony, who then received a letter from Octavian, wishing for them to talk. The three Caesarians later met, abandoning their past differences and forming the second triumvirate, with the goal to avenge Caesar's murder and carry on his legacy. The first order of business regarded the Senate, whom, everyone agreed, needed nothing short of a massive purge. Drafting a list of 300 senators to kill, the triumvirs took control of Rome, running a senatorial killing spree and appropriating their wealth. Among the killed were Cicero, who later had his hands chopped off and posted on the forum by Anthony, just like a true Caesarian would do. With the remaining senators now being a combination of the ones Caesar appointed earlier and the ones too cowardly to object, the Senate proclaimed the Second Triumvirate a legal institution that gave all three members dictatorial authority. To challenge the rule, both Brutus and Cassius had amassed 100,000 legionaries in Macedonia. To confront them, Lapidus agreed to fork over seven of his legions to Anthony and Octavian. And yeah, he just agreed to doing that. No ifs or buts. Some men are just servile by nature. When the Triumvirs landed on Greece, the Liberators blockaded their supply lines, hoping to starve the troops out as they held on their fortifications between mountains and swamps. But it was through those very swamps that Mark Anthony attacked, surprising Cassius's legions and taking over their camp. And when he heard that Brutus had taken over the Triumvirs' abandoned camps, he killed himself out of pure spite. Anthony then clashed with Brutus, routing him to the nearest hill, where, defeated, he realized just how much of a traitorous bastard he was, and then killed himself out of shame. After the battle, Octavian cut off Brutus's head and threw it at the feet of a statue of Julius Caesar, his death now finally avenged. The triumvirate victorious, the Republic's provinces were divided among the free men, with Gaul agreed to be left alone. And wait a fucking minute, who the fuck gave his planet to Lepidus? Yeah, that's right. But there was still the question of Sextus Pompey, who had re-emerged after taking control of both Sicily and the senatorial fleet, using it to blockade Italy from grain supplies. And now Octavian was left ruling between hungry plebs demanding wheat to his right, veteran legionnaires demanding retirement lands to his left, and Sextus Pompey dabbing at his boats at the coast. All while Cleopatra had Anthony licking her feet, and Lapidus watched paint dry in Africa, or whatever the dude did. Despite these difficulties, Octavian still honored his dead great-uncle, raising him to the status of a god, thus making Octavian Divi Filius, the son of a god. He then held a big party to celebrate the gods, dressing himself as Apollo, the old Trojan sun deity of logic and reason, whom Octavian held an expectable affinity for. But after that, Anthony's wife and brother threw a revolt and took over Rome, overthrowing Octavian and finally killing... <laughs> Just kidding. Anthony himself didn't seem to care about his wife's death though, I wonder why. But what happened next he was really forced to care. The governor of Gaul had recently died, and the legions there then declared their allegiance to Octavian's banner. This sudden change in the power scale triggered Cleopatra, and thus Anthony, to no end. She immediately sent her slave to invade Italy, allied with Sextus and kill Octavian, whom had actually just married Sextus' aunt-in-law, so that didn't really work out. Also, when the legions met at Brundisium, they simply refused to fight Octavian. Left hanging by their armies, Cleopatra then had no choice but to have Anthony renew the second triumvirate, sealing it with a marriage of Octavian's sister, Octavia, to the recently widowed Anthony. And what about Sextus? Well, Octavian allowed him to keep his islands to lift the blockade, later pardoning all exiled Roman families since Fulvius Chimpout. Among these included Tiberius Claudius Nero. An extremely auspicious name, isn't it? But chill, he wasn't any of the three people you just imagined right now. 
although his son was, but it's his wife we're gonna talk about, Livia Drusilla, whom, after personally meeting Octavian, instantly fell in love, divorced her husband, and convinced Octavian to get on with her. He seemed into it, so divorced Scribonia just after she gave birth to his daughter Julia, and married Livia just after her second son Drusus was born. And yeah, I know, names, names, names. This is the Julio-Claudian dynasty, you pleb, get used to it. But peace didn't last long, as Sextus, unhappy over just ruling the islands he had, had re-established the blockade of Italy, destroying Octavian's fleet shortly after. To deal with Sextus once and for all, Octavian had Agrippa, by then governor of Gaul, elected as consul, whom proceeded to cut through a lake near Naples and forming an inner harbor, training a new fleet of bigger, stronger ships to face Sextus. The years passed and the second triumvirate was renovated, this time sealed by a military exchange, 120 of Anthony's ships for four of Octavian's legions. Why Octavian needed more ships we already know, but what's with Anthony and uh, Cleopatra needing more legions? To invade Parthia, of course, with 100,000 men, 25,000 of which would freeze to death in the Armenian mountain ranges as their siege weapons were destroyed and the legions were forced to retreat. Seeing how stupidly Cleopatra was wasting her men's lives, Octavian never bothered delivering those four legions. Instead, he coordinated a combined attack with Agrippa and Lapidus to take down Sextus. As Agrippa's newly trained ships faced Sextus' main fleet, both Lapidus and Octavian invaded the island, taking town after town. And after Agrippa crushed his fleet in the Battle of Nolicus, Sextus fled once more, this time to Anatolia, where he was executed without trial by its local governor. And that was that. The blockade of Italy was lifted, Sicily finally taken, and... <laughs> wait, wait, is this serious? Lapidus actually tried to claim the island for himself? <laughs> uh, <laughs> In answer of this hilarious move, Octavian used his charisma to have all of Lapidus' legions de facto his side, then demoting and kicking him out of the triumvirate, being left to live a quiet life as Pontifex Maximus in rural Italy with his family, doing what he did best. Absolutely nothing. The Republic's provinces were now divided between Octavian's west and Anthony's east, and just at the border between them, Octavian carried out a series of campaigns in Pannonia, annexing it into Illyricum. Keep that overall image in mind, it will be relevant in like, 5 episodes. But what's relevant right now was just how tight Cleopatra's grip on Anthony had become. Not only had Anthony completely squared his wife Octavian in favor of Cleopatra, but he had several children with her, celebrated triumphs outside Rome, and dressed, lived, and spoke like an Egyptian. What's more, Octavian managed to get a copy of Anthony's will after his death, and when he saw it for the first time, he wasn't sure if he should laugh, explode in anger, or outright vomit, so he just read it to the Senate. In what would later be remembered as the Gibbs of Alexandria, Anthony proclaimed his will to- wait, scratch that. Anthony proclaimed his will to have Cleopatra and her children inherit all of Rome's eastern provinces, with Cleopatra being claimed Queen of Kings, and her son with Caesar, King of Kings. Outraged at how Cleopatra had made Anthony betray the Roman people, with the second triumvirate now expired once more, the Senate declared war on her. To start out hostilities, Cleopatra and her slave Anthony sailed to Greece to later invade Italy. But stopping them short was Agrippa, whom, together with his veteran sailors, had crushed Anthony's allied fleets and cornered them into Actium. Cleopatra then eagerly awaited behind the front lines for an opportunity to attack, but her battle plans had been uncovered by Octavian, whom ordered Agrippa to hold his position. With her legions defecting to Octavian's side more and more, Cleopatra ordered Anthony to attack. What ensued was nothing short of a massacre. Agrippa's veteran sailors completely annihilated Cleopatra's fleet, and seeing that defeat was imminent, she cowardly fled the battle for a gap in the lines, followed by her slave all the way back to Egypt. The war was lost. Cleopatra could do nothing but order Anthony to muster as many troops as possible before Octavian's arrival, but with all of his generals and troops defecting, there was no point. Unwilling to lift her spell over him, she had him fall on his own sword. But Cleopatra, being a woman, really sucked at suicide, so she just watched Anthony wail in agony for a while before he died, a last moment of entertainment before her own time came. Not much later came Octavian, meeting with Cleopatra to discuss the terms of her surrender. In a last ditch effort, she tried to cast her demonic spells on him, but as the divine descendant of Aeneas, Octavian was completely immune to her eastern tricks, later having her son Caesarion killed, thus depriving her of her last political asset. Unable to cope with being bested by Aeneas' progeny once again, Dido's reincarnation, now aware of her incompetence at suicide, simply let herself be bit by a venomous snake, cursing Rome once again. She will be back. Octavian would then annex Egypt as his own personal property, later visiting the mausoleum of Alexander the Great, and laughing at his pathetic life. For when Alexander became king, he was 20, 
When Octavian was adopted by Caesar, he was 19. When Alexander took 13 years to conquer the shithole of the East, Octavian took the same time to subdue the entire Mediterranean. And while Alexander's empire disintegrated the nanosecond after he died, Octavian would lay the foundations for the greatest empire in human history. And so, to commemorate his victories, Octavian celebrated three triumphs. The first for finally bringing the barbarians of Pannonia to heel, the second to gather Agrippa for BTFO and Cleopatra in Actium, and a third one for the conquest of Egypt, marching Cleopatra's children in chains. Present in these triumphs was his nephew, Marcellus, Octavian's chosen heir, together with his stepson, Tiberius, whom hated triumphs, hated people, hated being alive, but he was Octavian's stepson, so he had to act a part. But just as Octavian's unrivaled accomplishments and republican virtues made him popular with the plebs, so had he driven his enemy to the edge of envy and resentment. They were revolted by the existence of someone so perfect, even more so one whom they owed their lives to. Unable to bear the thought of Octavian returning to Rome triumphant once more, a conspiracy was born, led by Lepidus the Younger, with... <laughs> nah, just kidding again. With the civil wars now truly over, Octavian demobilized 32 of his 60 legions, paying their retirement with Egyptian gold and keeping the other 28 legions up to secure the provinces. To thank the gods, Octavian built a temple to Apollo, while Agrippa built a pantheon for all gods. It would later be renovated by Hadrian into the form we see today in Rome. You know, while he wasn't busy either killing Jews, building walls, or fucking twinks. It was in this time that the Aeneid was written by Virgil, a magnificent historical document that detailed the entire saga from Aeneas' departure from Troy to Octavian's rise to power, displaying Rome's divine destiny to civilize the world and bring forth an eternity of order. And now, with peace having been brought to Rome, Octavian could finally resign his consulship, knowing that he did his part. But once the Senate heard that he planned to resign, they begged him to reconsider, falling on their knees and imploring their master to keep giving them orders. Some men are truly servile by nature. Octavian was reluctant, having no real desire for power. But if the people's representatives proclaimed him so indispensable, then it was his duty to answer their call. In 27 BC, the Senate convened to grant Octavian 10 years of proconsular authority over Egypt, Spain, Gaul, Syria, Cilicia and Cyprus together with the 20 legions in them stationed, and to cement his authority, they granted him a new title. Octavian's full name from there on would be Imperator Kaiser Divifilius Augustus, the princeps of the Republic and the first emperor of the Roman Empire. And now that the Republic's institutions had been safely enveloped into the imperial fold, Augustus, as Rome's first emperor, set about the arduous quest of stabilizing the empire's borders, starting with Hispania, whose border guard just had to be ended, and Augustus didn't care how many illnesses he caught while doing it. He then had to escort Messina's away after he revealed some information about a plot to his wife, making him untrustworthy. But he had bigger problems to deal with by then, like that ultra-lethal typhoid fever he just contracted like now. Laying on his deathbed, and with Marcellus being way too young, Augustus proclaimed Agrippa to be the one to succeed his office as princeps. But just as his life hanged on the balance, his medic brought the urn containing Caesar's divine ashes, using it to heal Augustus from his fever. Once healthy again, Augustus oversaw another set of reforms to his position. He had no need to be granted continuous consulships, but humbly asked to be nothing more than a permanent tribune and proconsular authority in whatever province he physically found himself in. And what's a better way to celebrate it than to have your intended heir die of food poisoning, killed by your own wife, no less. Why did you do it? To have her son Tiberius be the heir, of course, whom Augustus always kept at the bottom of his list for potential heirs. And with his daughter now widowed, Augustus remarried her to Agrippa, with whom they would have five children, among them Gaius and Lucius, whom Augustus adopted as his heirs. In his next step to stabilize the empire's borders, he set to deal with Parthia, as had once Crassus, Caesar and Anthony. Augustus' approach was swift and simple. First, he sent Tiberius to restore Armenia as a client kingdom, then started to deploy more and more legions on Syria, then contacted the Parthian king, offering him a choice. He could either return Crassus' eagle standards and agree to peaceful relations, or he could refuse and have war against the full might of a united Rome with vengeance in their eyes. As you can see portrayed here, the Parthian king then returned all eagle standards and ran back to his desert shithole. And in order to prevent any further conspiracies while Augustus settled the empire's problems, he created the Praetorian Guard. The historians in the audience know well where this will lead. But let's enjoy it while they were loyal bodyguards, because they won't be for fucking long. But Augustus himself would remain uncorrupted, 
constantly spending his fortunes to build roads throughout the empire, making so that all roads led to Rome. But there was another issue, beyond the realm of the provinces. It was the hard fact that Rome had become a degenerate cesspool of adultery. Long gone were the traditional conservative Roman families with a strong father and an obedient mother that birthed many children. These days, most Roman women just spread their legs for anything resembling a dildo, refusing to have many, if any, children at all. As a man far ahead of his time, Augustus predicted that such degenerate behavior would eventually bring forth the destruction of the state. So Augustus used his powers to reward all families that maintained their virtues and punish those who didn't. Not that his anti-degeneracy policies achieved much, he was a lost cause by then. But not for his stepsons Justus and Tiberius though, both of whom married and had their own kids. Among them Germanicus, named so for his father's victories in Germania. What victories you ask? Well, you see. After Alagad got defeated by some invading germs in Gaul, Augustus had had enough of the barbarians up north. As he surveyed a map of the northern provinces, he concluded the ideal imperial borders were defined by the Danube and Elbe rivers, providing a near impenetrable barrier from the lawless lands beyond. And so, Augustus set towards the quest that would consume the rest of his natural life. Civilizing Germania. For this enormous task, he sent both of his stepsons, Tiberius and Drusus, whom assisted each other in finally conquering the Alpine tribes for the empire extending its borders to include the provinces of Raetia and Noricum. In Raetia, the brothers quickly learned of the Germanic unwillingness of being civilized, expelling as many germs up north as they could. And while they do that, tell me, you remember Lepidus? He just died about nowish, so Augustus inherited his title as Pontifex Maximus. Just saying. And say, do you remember when Augustus conquered Pannonia? Yeah, he sent Agrippa to mop up some resistance there, only for him to be secretly poisoned by Livia and die just like that. The loss of his most trusted general and closest friend broke the emperor's heart, and it was all downhill from here. To secure his family's integrity, Augustus made Tiberius divorce his wife and marry Julia, whom he hated for being an adulterer whore, but the emperor didn't know, so didn't understand why Tiberius was complaining so much as he took command over Pannonia. All while Drusus spent his days campaigning over the Rhine, slaughtering all germs he could find between it and the Alba, including the Cheruski, whose prince he took as hostage. And while he would have him killed if he could, Drusus hoped that if a germ could be brought from a young enough age into the legions, fought alongside Romans and live alongside Romans, then he would eventually be civilized. And so, that boy would be raised as a legionnaire, given the name Arminius. Back in Rome, Drusus' success was greatly scaring Livia, as he robbed the emperor's attention from her favorite son. And while he was busy renaming a month after himself, Livia bribed a soldier into her service, sending him north. And while Drusus took a stride through the woods, the assassin suddenly knocked him off his horse. Mortally injured, Drusus died a few weeks later, leaving his family at the hands of his eldest son, Germanicus. Drusus' death was yet another heavy blow for Augustus, but by no means the last. Messinus' death came soon after, leaving him with no old friends to speak of. And to make matters worse, the Parthians were meddling with Armenia once again, and when he sent Tiberius to deal with it, he refused, and exiled himself to Rhodes. Why? To get away from his whore of a wife, that's why. Whom Augustus just didn't realize for who she was, banishing her and all her lovers from Rome. But thankfully, the emperor still had his grandchildren to rely on, so he sent Gaius to Armenia instead, where Livia would bribe his own soldiers to kill him during a siege. Lucius would later get infected with a fever by Livia's orders while in Gaul, and also die. Posthumus, following Livia's advice, grew up to be a vicious little cunt, so he had to be banished. And Julia the Younger, also listening to Livia, became as much of a degenerate whore as her mother, getting banished as well. Livia forgot to ruin Agrippina though, and so Augustus happily married her to Germanicus. But now that Livia had deprived Augustus of just about enough potential heirs, he was forced to recall Tiberius to Rome as his heir, whom, after hearing of Julia's banishment, had no more reasons to exile himself. The only condition was that Tiberius adopted Germanicus as his heir, so that the empire would be ruled by Julians again after him. Yeah, Germanicus won't be long for this world. Back to the provinces, Augustus later sent Tiberius to Pannonia, where a huge rebellion had broken out. And I do mean huge. One million rebels, like fuck me dude. Later sending Germanicus to help crush it, alongside most of the empire's legions. During the revolt, Arminius would distinguish himself as a competent and loyal soldier, later being promoted to serve beside the new commander of the three remaining Rhine legions, Publius Quintilius Varus. (sighs) 
With the conquest of Germania so close to being finished, Arminius took this chance that most legions had been sent away, to show his true colors. Maintaining his forests, he convinced Varus to let the German tribes host a cohort each for the winter, having them all slaughtered in his back, later telling him of a fake rebellion in the north, deep inside the Teutoburg forest. Honor bound and dismissing his officers' alerts, Varus went down the path Arminius had suggested, crossing a swamp while out of formation, surrounded by dark forests, and right into his ambush. With a genocidal drive inherent to their being, the Germanic hordes overran the Romans, slaughtering all the defenseless soldiers, hunting down the survivors in the forest, lives sacrificing the officers to satiate their evil gods of chaos, and destroying every last shred of civilization the Romans had brought with them beyond the Rhine. Betrayed and beaten, Varus grabbed hold of his sword and took his own life. When news of the catastrophe reached Augustus, the emperor was broken for a final time, traumatized by the sheer evil displayed by the Germans. He secluded himself in the imperial palace, stopped eating for days and shaving for months. His mission to civilize Germania had failed. The ideal imperial borders would never be reached. Forever the germs would remain, as the irredeemable enemies of all that is civilized and good. As his last years passed by, Augustus would occasionally lay on a dark corner of the wall and scream. Varus. Oh! Varus, give me back my legions! At the height of his depression, he would pay a secret visit to his last living grandson, Posthumus, who had by then repented of his violent ways. But Livia quickly found out and chose to secure her son's position as heir once and for all. As Augustus traveled through Italy, he passed by Nola, the city his biological father had died in so long ago, eating away the figs he so enjoyed. But by then, his wife's poison had already kicked in. Augustus struggled as long as he could, but he continued to lose strength, his mind slowly wavering. After a lifetime of transforming Rome from a city of bricks into one of marble, he whispered his final words. Have I played a part well? Then applaud as I exit. Give me back! Give me back!